everyone. Glad to see you all here today, hopefully. I can't see if you're here today, but you know what I mean. Uh, I just want to remind every... Oh, there we go. Oh, my microphone's on now. I just want to remind everyone, you are seeing my, the green bar wiggle, aren't you, Don? Yes. Okay. I would like to remind everyone that uh, Jesus is still Lord, even in difficult times like we are having right now. Some of us are mildly inconvenienced as we're stuck at home. Some of us are very gravely worried about the future. But let's take the focus off of our problems and put the focus on Jesus by singing holy, holy, holy. So here we go. singing along at home. Remember, if you were always too embarrassed to sing at church, now you're at home. A few announcements this morning. Tonight at 6 p.m., uh, the community service will be streaming from Forward Community Church. On a fifth Sunday, every fifth Sunday, we have a community church as much as uh, as many of the different churches that gather as want to gather at, in one place. We won't be able to gather in one place, but we will be streaming and that'll be on Forward Community Church's page, uh, I believe. And so uh, be sure and tune in to that tonight and worship with brothers and sisters of various, um, various denominations and various churches. And so we thank the Lord for that. Uh, we didn't uh, have a prayer yet, so let's go ahead and have a prayer time. Father, we thank you for all that you've given us. We thank you for your love. Oh, Lord, we just pray that your hand will be upon us as we worship together and as we uh, take our, the focus off of the terrible things going on in the world and focus on you. Lord, you've blessed us in so many ways. And I just pray that though we cannot be together in physical form, we can be together in spirit and in truth. Lord, I pray that as we draw close to you, 
that we will be able to spiritually draw close to each other and be of one accord. In Jesus' name, amen. It's so easy to get down about what is going on in the world, so I think we should sing Count Your Blessings because uh, it is, uh, this is a time when we need to take stock of all the good things that are going on. Many people are home with their families that were always too busy to be home with their families. People are possibly checking us out online who never darken the doors of a church. All the good things that are happening right now. If you still have your job and you still have a way to make money, thank God. Whenever this is over, thank God. Thank God for being so good to us. When upon life's billows you are tempest-tossed When you are discouraged thinking all is lost Count your many blessings, name them one by one And it will surprise you what the Lord hath done Count your blessings, name them one by one Count your blessings, see what God hath done Seem heavy, you are called to bear. Count your many blessings, every doubt will fly, and you will be singing as the days go by. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God hath done. Christ has promised you his wealth untold. Count your many blessings money cannot buy. Your reward in heaven or your home on high. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God hath done. Conflict, whether great or small, do not be discouraged, God is over all. Count your many blessings, angels will attend. Help and comfort give you to your journey's end. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Now, if normally you are with us on Sunday mornings, you would know that this song would normally be our offertory song. Please, if you are able to give, and we've never watched over people's shoulders to see if they give or not in the offering plate, and if anyone is has been, you need to tell your pastor, okay? But um, if you are still able to give, our church would greatly appreciate it. Our church still has bills to pay. You can mail us a check at our at our mailing address, and uh, if, if you're scared of that, I know some people have expressed concerns that people do steal checks out of mailboxes and those sort of things, uh, you can go to our webpage and donate on the webpage. Uh, our square is available for the many members of our church who have a key to the building. Also, I would like to announce that most of the church has been cordoned off. Uh, if you come in the front door, if you were to come in the front door, most of us don't have a reason to come to the building at all. But for those of us who are volunteers here and workers here, uh, the sanctuary is open. We are still doing lives from here. The church offices are still open. And, and one bathroom, the nursery bathroom, is still open. Everything else is being sanitized or has already been sanitized, and we'd like to keep people out of there uh, for the time being. As I mentioned earlier, it would be good to take the focus off of 
our current situation and worship the Lord. And so we're going to sing a song from about the 600s A.D. Uh, written by a monk in back back when it was Ireland spoke its own language, and they still have that old language, their own language, but they predominantly speak English these days. But from way back then, uh, a monk wrote this poem. Someone translated it into English, and we still sing it today. It's called "Be Thou My Vision." It connects us to the Christians of ages past. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be all else to me, save that Thou art. Thou my best thought, by day or by night. Waking or sleeping, Thy presence my light. Be Thou my song. Well, I did something very silly. I, uh, on my list of things to do this morning was to change the battery in this lapel mic. And so I'm going to check my light to see, nope, lights off. I will be right back. So I'm hoping that you will be able to hear me via this microphone that is down here that was picking up my guitar. Shut the power off. If you have your Bible in front of you, you can go ahead and be turning to Luke chapter 5. Wow. There we go. Luke chapter 5. And for my own convenience, I'm going to go ahead and get this battery in here. Jesus calls his disciples. We've been telling Bible stories through the Bible, and this is a... There we go. You should be able to... I should be back in action by now. I can go ahead and mute this. And... Uh, Make sure I remember to throw that away and not store it. If you want to go ahead and open your Bibles to Luke chapter 5, in Matthew and Mark, we simply get the details that say that uh, Jesus was walking along the seashore and called his disciples, and they followed him. I have heard that some preachers have decided that that means that Jesus walked around with some kind of supernatural ability to just draw people to him. Now, 
Jesus had supernatural ability. So I am certainly not going to doubt that. But if you do open your Bibles to Luke chapter 5, we find that there was probably more to the story. In fact, <clears throat> Jesus seems to run into several of his future leaders a couple of times. In fact, when it comes to uh, Peter, who we are going to focus on today, or Simon, as he is known before he encounters Jesus, uh, There we go, chapter 5. Uh, one day, Andrew, Simon's brother, comes home and says, we have found the Messiah, because Andrew had been out following John the Baptist, and John the Baptist had been preaching and teaching and baptizing, and one day John the Baptist pointed out, Jesus said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, and, and, and through many conversations, John expressed to his disciples, you should really be following him. He's going to increase, I'm going to decrease. And my whole job was to point him out anyway. And so uh, Andrew comes home and tells Peter, his brother, we have found the one we've been waiting for. And so that's, uh, that's pretty fantastic. But we're going to read another story here. Uh, they were... Peter and Andrew, and also another pair of brothers, James and John, were fishermen by trade. In fact, James and John seem to be uh, learning the trade still from their father, so they might have been very young. In fact, the Bible tells us that John was the youngest of the disciples and that he was the, the kid brother, sort of adopted kid brother of Jesus. There's even a tradition that James and John's mother, Salome, was either Jesus' mother Mary's sister, and so these were his younger cousins. There's a different tradition that says that Salome was the previous, uh, was a, a wife that Joseph already had, making, no, wait a minute, yes, that would make Salome Jesus' older sister, and that would make her sons James and John uh, nephews. And what are you going to do with it? It's tradition, it's legend, it's, we don't know what category it goes in. The Gospels do not specifically tell us if James and John were related at all to Mary, the mother of Jesus. It would make some passages make more sense. At one point, Salome, the mother of James and John, comes to Jesus and says, Now you've got to understand, James and John need to be at the top of your organization. One of them should sit at your right hand. One of them should sit at your left hand. Makes more sense if she sees Jesus as a younger relative that she can kind of boss around. Anyways, that's neither here nor there. In this story today, not only does Simon Peter see, uh, encounter Jesus and is called by Jesus, but Jesus works a miracle. So, let's read Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. And if I have said the wrong passage, you'll straighten me out, right, Don? Thanks to Don Sloan, who's here running the computer for me. Luke chapter 5, <clears throat> starting in verse 1. On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two boats by the lake. But the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing, but at your word I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats, so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for all that you have given us. We thank you for your love and your kindness. Father, we thank you for calling us to be fishers of men 
And I pray for us, O Lord, that we would leave behind everything and follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, thank you for joining us here on Facebook or possibly our website since we did seem to be able to get that running. Uh, sorry if you were wanting to watch, if YouTube was going to be a little easier for you, sorry we haven't gotten that straightened out yet. But here in Luke 5, I am reminded of when I had a job working the overnight shift. Now, I've always been a night owl, and so I thought that working from 11 o'clock at night to 7 o'clock in the morning would be uh, perfectly fine with me. The problem is around 5 a.m., back when I was a night owl, I've kind of fixed that, and I get drowsy around 10 or 11 o'clock now, but, but uh, back when I was a real night owl, or an insomniac is probably what I really was, uh, staying up all night, five nights a week, took a toll on me. And I remember that the worst of it was leaving the factory at 7 a.m. and driving home with a full view of a beautiful sunrise. And of course, that sunrise was telling my body that it was time to get up and do things. And I thought to myself, if we could just get off an hour earlier, if we could just shift the shifts, to an hour earlier, I could go home in the dark. I could go into the room where I have shades and darkening cur room darkening curtains and, and all of those things to help me sleep for the next eight hours so that I can get caught up and I can maybe go get some errands done before I have to go to work tonight. But of course, they weren't going to shift that around just because it was my opinion. I don't even think I was a permanent employee there. I was probably just a temp looking for a job. But driving home at 7 a.m., that sunrise told me, it's time to get up. And, my, and I tried to tell my body, no, it's time to go to sleep. Simon Peter has a job that he has most likely inherited from his father. That job says, you've got to fish all night. And I would imagine that as the sun came up, they would bring their boats ashore and they would having cast their nets into that sea. Now, uh, the, lake of Gal uh, the Sea of Galilee is not technically a sea. It's an inland lake, like the Great Lakes that we have here in North America. And much like the Great Lakes, you can get out into the middle of the Sea of Galilee, and I believe it's about four miles across, and you can get out in the middle of it and not be able to see land. I'm from Lake of the Ozarks, and that's basically an uh, overgrown river. They dammed up the river, the river flooded, but it still looks like a river. You can see the other, one from one bank, you can see the other bank in, in just about all the places. This is an inland lake, and you can get out there in the middle of the sea and not see uh, land. So when, when it says that Simon and his brother Andrew and James and his brother John were professional fishermen, they were professional fishermen. They were looking for a big haul to sell and make money, they would go out all night and they would drag the sea with nets, big fishing nets, not pole fishing. I'm sure they had that technology back then, but these are commercial fishermen. They are looking for a catch and they drag those nets and those nets get snagged on every little thing that's in there and they pull up rough fish and they pull up things that they don't want. You gotta sort through a catch when you get a catch and, and you know how it is to cast a hook in and pull out a leather boot, man. I'm sure they got that first century version of all that kind of stuff in those nets and those nets got snagged. And so I imagine that at the end of every night as they fished in the cool of the night so that the fish would be closer to the surface, as all good fishermen know, uh, they would bring in those nets and my ver translation says washing, but that was probably a term for general maintenance. They were mending their nets and getting ready for the next night before they could go home and catch some shut-eye. And along comes someone on a totally different schedule. This hot, young, new rabbi, this teacher, he's gathering crowds. His cousins with John, John the Baptist was out there gathering huge crowds. And then John the Baptist said, this is the guy we're waiting for. And now Jesus is out there gathering huge crowds. And at the end of my workday, just put yourself in Peter's shoes, at the end of my workday, here comes this educated, white-collar, 
teacher, preacher guy. And I'm supposed to respect him because I live in that kind of religious culture where I've got to show him respect. A lot of this is reading between the lines. You read the scripture to see what was definitely true. I'm going to fill in a few things that I think. And uh, as this teacher is teaching this crowd, the crowd keeps pressing and pressing closer and closer to hear him. And before long, he turns around and he is at the edge of the Sea of Galilee. He can't go back any further. So in order to get some relief from the crowd, the boats have been pushed into the beach, or the sh whatever the shore looked like there. And he approaches this professional fisherman who is mending his nets and says, can I address the crowd? Can we push the boat out a little bit? And I can address the crowd from the boat. This was a common thing in ancient times, not necessarily speaking from a boat, but if you went to the sea, uh, in fact, there were amphitheaters built by the sea so that the speaker would have the sea behind them and the wind, because it's nice and flat over that sea, there's nothing to stop wind. So if you're by a big body of water, the wind comes off that big body of water and it will carry your voice if your back is to the sea. And so this worked out well for Jesus. He was able to escape the crowd by being out in the water and the wind was carrying his voice to address the sea. And since it was Simon's boat, he was probably brought his net that he was working on so he could sit in the boat with Jesus, do whatever needed to be done with the boat, and maybe continue mending his nets. Or perhaps out of respect, he put his nets down, and, and, and uh, that probably annoyed him too. But then as Jesus winds up his sermon, he turns to Simon and said, so how are you doing? You know, uh, I myself, sermons and things are natural. I'm an introvert, and and uh, but we got to learn from Jesus and turn to people and say, you know, how are you doing? Thanks for letting me use your boat. How are you doing? How was the catch last night? Which is what you ask fishermen. You always ask fishermen this. That's just polite. How are they biting? How's the fish? And uh, Simon said, actually, you know, we fished all night. We didn't catch a thing. And uh, Jesus says, why don't you, since we're out in the boat anyways, let's go put the nets down in the deep part of the water. And we'll catch fish. And, you know, maybe, maybe this was, the idea was that Jesus would kind of pay Simon back a little bit. You made him get his boat out. How about he catch some fish? And Simon says, sir, I believe that I get the impression that Simon is kind of this blue-collar worker, doesn't like dealing with religious folks. You know, we got, we got a lot of folks in our area. Maybe they feel like they don't have nice clothes, and I don't mean that they're poor and all their clothes are rags. I mean they dress casual everywhere they go, and they're worried that if they ever came to our church, they would have to go buy a different wardrobe because people dress up at church. Hopefully... And, and we got people, if, if we do have a rule like that at our church, we got people that break it. So don't worry, there's no rule, okay? But I imagine that Peter is one of those people, ah, I think I know about religious people. I don't want to hang out with religious people. Jesus, you're a teacher of religious things, and so I'm going to be respectful. I'm going to do what culture says. I'm going to, because you told me to come on out here, but I'm warning you, man. We fished all night. They're not biting. We haven't caught anything. They're not swimming into our nets. Somebody warned them we're coming. We don't know what's going on. Jesus is adamant that he should do this, and he says, well, if you insist, Peter's still being very polite to the teacher. They go out, they lower the nets, and lo and behold, after fishing all night and catching nothing, and now the time of day has changed to where the fish should not be available for fishing, and that's why they fish at night, Simon has a problem on his hands, the good kind of problem to have, because he cannot pull the load of fish back into the boat. And you know how it is if you like to go fishing like I do. You can tell the difference between when you're snagged on something, it won't move, you keep pulling on it, and it's not moving with you, it's not moving against you, you're stuck on a log. But he can tell, there are swimming fish tugging on this net. And so, um, and, and uh, he signals to his partners, my brother Andrew, James and John, get in your boat, come out here. 
I need help with this, and we're going to pay for the bad night that we had. And they still struggle to get this amount of fish into the boat. And I love this, and now this is my favorite scene because I do kind of see Peter as this blue-collar guy who is only doing what Jesus tells him to because he feels like he has to because Jesus is an important person. But you can just see, uh, now I, I, get in, uh, I get in what I call uh, task-oriented mode. If you think maybe, I, especially when something traumatic happens, I just start thinking about all the things I need to do, and I don't think about my emotions. Uh, when our first child was born, someone asked me if I was nervous, and I said, I, just, I probably was nervous, but this was my reaction. I got to do this, I got to do this, I got to do this, I, I got to take care of Ashley, I got to get... Uh, make sure the arrangements are made at the hospital. When we get, the, you know, I got to have the rooms ready because her mother's coming to stay with us when the baby's born. And all, you know, I had a list of things to do, and that was what occupied my brain. And so I can imagine Peter, he's got this list of things to do. He's got this huge catch. He's got to keep his boat from sinking. He's got to get the nets into the thing. He's got, he's already making plans. How are we going to, you know, what are we going to do to, we got to get these to market. Uh, I got to organize James and John, who might be younger than him. You know, and so maybe he's in charge of them. His brother Andrew is there, and 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 I got to do all of this, and we got to make sure that the rabbi doesn't fall out of the boat while we're rocking and reeling on the thing and everything. And he's just, and he gets to a point where he doesn't necessarily have to think about all of those things anymore, and it suddenly dawns on him that he is with a righteous man, and in the Jewish mind, if you're more righteous, the more God listens to you. And here's a man who says, you know, it's the wrong time of day, but go out, put down your nets, and you get the... Here's a man who performed a miracle, basically. And so you can just see Peter, he's working, 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 and all of a sudden the light bulb, or I guess back then the candle, comes on above his head, and he says to himself, I'm in the presence of a miracle worker. I'm in the presence of someone that God listens to. And he turns to Jesus, and I believe this is just Peter being honest. He says in verse 8, He fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. I think the polite facade of Peter washed away at that point because Peter grew up with the stories of <clears throat> God striking the Egyptians with plagues, God parting the Red Sea, God visiting destruction upon his enemies, God who gets, uh, allows bad things to happen to people when they won't follow him and everything, and suddenly it's, it's kind of like the person who jokingly tells you, oh, no, I can't come to your church. The roof will cave in if I come to your church. They feel like they're such a sinner that if they were in the presence of a holy God, that God would destroy them. Peter does not feel worthy to be in the presence of God or a man who's in really good with God. He feels that he is a sinful man and that he is in danger as long as Jesus is there. Depart from me, I am an evil man. Or... Maybe it's more of a dirtiness thing. I don't want to soil a good man like Jesus with my presence. I feel bad about the kind of person that I am being around this preacher and teacher. And they were so surprised. Verse 10, And so also were James and John, son of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. You know, Peter looked at his own life and he said, there is nothing here that God would want. I'm a sinful man. Jesus said, I've got a place in my organization for a fisherman. So I need you and I'm going to take you from someone who catches fish to someone who catches people. In fact, Simon 
would go on to be renamed the rock, which is what Peter means, by Jesus. And for the time that Simon Peter was on the earth, he was the leader of Jesus' movement after Jesus left. He was the top dog. He, he was the guy. Can you imagine going from not just a, a, a blue-collar guy, and I'm not trying to say anything about blue-collar, but we are kind of down on blue-collar. In fact, this whole situation that we are in, we are learning that our real heroes are not the NBA that can't help us now, although a lot of those people are doing very good things right now, like paying the salaries of the people that work in the, uh, in the arenas and the, and the uh, places that, that they would be having their games right now. Uh, but, but they're not the heroes. The heroes that are keeping us alive right now are truck drivers and fast food workers and Walmart shelf stalkers and all of that. And I would just like to say that, you know, sometimes God sees things differently because he can see the spiritual things going on behind. And sometimes God sees things differently just because we are all wrong. And Jesus says, I want the top man in my organization, in my church, to be someone who knows how to catch people. I want a fisherman to be the CEO of my new movement. Can you imagine? And so I want you to hear the word of the Lord today. Perhaps you think that your skills are not needed at our church. Perhaps you think that someone as sinful as you is not needed at our church or another church and certainly not needed by a holy God. But Jesus can take care of the sin problem. He's had to do it for all of us because all of us are sinful. And we live our lives before Jesus for ourselves, and, and we are selfish, and we are mean, and, and we, you know, we are, when we say that there's nothing in us that God should want it's just honesty we don't like to be around sinful people and then one day we realize we are sinful people and that we go in the same category as all those other groups that we were always pointing our finger at but praise god hallelujah our sin was paid for on the cross by jesus jesus came to forgive those sins and to wash them away to pay the debt for them and so you don't just feel just quit feeling bad about being a sinner because, hey, everybody's a sinner. You quit, you quit feeling bad about being a sinner because Jesus can take it away. And he will give you a new record, and he will even give you a new uh, person to be. The Bible says you become a new creation. And even if you are a, you know, uh, this is where I can really get myself in trouble trying to think of jobs that people have that maybe society looks down on. The only problem is when I mention one of them, uh, perhaps you'll say, hey, wait a minute, who looks down on me? Nobody looks down on me. I tell you what, when I need a plumber, I ain't looking down on a plumber. When I need digging done, maybe to help with a plumbing problem or some other water flow issue, I don't look down on ditch diggers. And when we want to catch people, we need someone who knows how to use the right kind of bait. And maybe you, you know, and we're doing everything online now. And so maybe you are the person that we have always been laughing at and make fun of. Oh, they never put down their phone. Oh, they never, you know, just they're so different and weird and they know all about that. But now we're relying on you to help us put everything online and commit, connect with people even though they can't be there in person where you think that you are not the kind of person that God wants or, or would like to have, guess what, Peter? You're exactly what he created you to be, and he wants to use you. And I'm going to pray for you that you let God use you, however it is. Be creative. Lean into that creative urge about how you can reach people for God. And, and, and if you don't know the Lord, if all of this sounds very foreign, if you relate to Simon, who doesn't know Jesus, but he encounters Jesus and he, and he says, oh my gosh, I'm a sinful person, get away from me. But you don't relate to Peter. Maybe you don't know the Lord to begin with. God wants to change your heart. God might be speaking to you right now. 
even though you're just sitting in your living room watching something over the internet and there's some weirdo on there who's talking to a wall that has a camera on it. But maybe God wants to use this to get you the message that He loves you and He's always been there for you, but you've been ignoring Him up until now. But God wants you to put down all the things that you are worried about. God wants you to put down running your own life because none of us can run our lives. We need to submit to God. We need to turn our lives over to God. If you would like to surrender to God today, I want you to talk to Him. When we talk to God, we call it prayer. But sometimes that makes it sound like some special thing when all it really is is talking to God. And since you know that He's all-powerful and He's omnipresent, He's everywhere, He can hear you. No matter whether you're talking to the wall, you're talking to the ceiling, whatever it is, just say, God, and then tell Him whatever you really think because He's God and He already knows it. And you can tell Him you're sorry for your sins and you can tell Him that you know you're a sinner, but this preacher on the Internet says that you want me anyways. You tell God that you want Him too. And you ask Him to forgive, him of your, forgive you of your sins. You ask Him to come live in your heart and life. And you ask, just, tell, just lay it down. Say, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I've been trying to run my life. I've been trying to do a better job. And I'm only making things worse. And now there's all these things that are out of my control. And circumstances are spinning out of control and I feel like I'm getting sucked down into a dark void. I want to turn it all over to you. Help me, God. Whatever it is that is on your mind to say to God, say to God and ask Him for help. And He will guide you in the right way. He is listening. He hears. He's been waiting for you to do this. Who knows at this very moment he might have appointed for you to hear this message. Even if you watch it later when it's not live, he might have appointed for you to accidentally come across it and hear the message of the Lord. Whoever you are, God is in control of all things. If you're hearing the sound of my voice, God, the God of the universe, meant for you to hear it. So I'm going to pray that we follow Jesus. It was the best thing that ever happened to Simon. If he, he, he should have died in obscurity, one more fisherman on the Sea of Galilee that we don't know the name of, and yet we all know his name. There are statues of him throughout Europe and the rest of the world, whether they look anything like he did or not. And all of that because Jesus, the God of the universe, changed his life. So I'm going to pray for you that either you meet Jesus and follow Jesus, or if you've already met Jesus but... Maybe life has been too busy that you would decide to quit fooling around with all the other things and follow Jesus. I'm going to pray for you. Father, Lord, we know that you reach even farther than the Internet so that wherever anybody might be watching this, you are there, and you were there long before I was. Long, long, long before I was. And so... Lord, I just want to pray for everyone. Lord, I pray, I ask you that you would be working in hearts, and I thank you that you are working in hearts because that's the whole reason you came. You wanted to save us. And so, Father, we pray that you would work in hearts and that you would draw people to you and that people would give up their selfishness, give up their self-centeredness, especially now that all of our normal lives have been disrupted so much, Lord, Lord, we pray that you would use that not to turn people bitter, but to turn them towards you. We ask these things in your name. Amen. All right. Turn my guitar mic back on. Oh, my, my guitar is over here. We will sing our final song. Now, if you belong to Jesus, you are a child of the King. And I love this last song. It's called A Child of the King. And it says, My father is rich in houses and lands. And, and, and it also tells us that my father's son, Jesus, came and died. And I, I, I love all the verses. So you'll have the words on your screen. Uh, pay attention to the verse. As you sing, or if you're not singing especially, pay attention to the words and, and learn how God feels about you and what it means to belong to Jesus and be a part of the royal family now.
My Father is rich in houses and lands. He holdeth the wealth of the world in His hands, of rubies and diamonds, of silver and gold. His coffers are full, He has riches untold. I'm a child of the King, a child of the King, with Jesus my Savior, I'm a child of the King. My Father's own Son, the Savior of men, once wandered on earth as the poorest of them, but now He is pleading, kind base on high that we may be his when he comes by and by i'm a child of the king a child of the king with jesus my savior i'm a child of the king i once was an outcast stranger on earth, a sinner by choice, and an alien by birth. But I've been adopted, my name's written down, an heir to a mansion, a robe and a crown. I'm a child of the King, sing loud, a child of the King, with Jesus my Savior, I'm a child of the King. Children of the King, go forth in peace. Amen. Hallelujah. All done.